Good morning, NBC family and friends that might be joining us this morning as we worship the Lord. I want to thank all those that have worked so hard uh, at keeping our live stream going, those musicians that have came in and, and recorded those songs for us and, and worked real hard to keep our worship going. Uh, that's a blessing. No pun intended, but I feel like that technically I've been in each one of your living rooms or kitchens or wherever you might be watching us live stream. This morning, if you will, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew as we continue the Sermon on the Mount, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. Verse 14 and 15. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive. Forgive your transgressions. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning, thanking you that you've given us yet another opportunity to come and serve you. Father, our world has been turned upside down, but that's okay. You're still God. And Father, even in people's homes, they can continue to stay up with the word of God. We can continue to preach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can continue to pray for one another and love each other through this situation. And Father, all the while knowing that you are on your throne, that you are caring for us. So Father, I pray this morning as we look at these passages, these two verses in chapter 6, that you would help us to glean information from your word that can be applied to our hearts. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, that we can continue to live out what it means to be a believer. That we can continue to love our neighbor. Father, by praying for them. And at this moment, distancing ourselves from people. Lord, I pray for our church as a whole. Lord, I know that there's a lot of sickness and I know that there's a lot of surgical recoveries and things that people are struggling struggling with that is altogether different from COVID-19. So Lord, help us not to forget the other things that are going on in the lives of our people. So Father, we pray specifically for those people and you know who they are. So Lord, I pray that you continue to bless. I pray, Father, that you would apply this text to our heart, that we might glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. You might be wondering how these two verses that oftentimes get, get looked over because they're nestled tightly uh, in between Jesus' word on prayer and fasting. And sometimes we, we skip over them uh, and, and don't give them a lot of attention. The title of the message this morning is The Fruit of True Forgiveness. The Fruit of True Forgiveness. One of the fondest memories that I have as a child uh, growing up in my grandparents' house. Uh, not that my mother was far off. She was in rock-throwing distance of, of my grandparents' house. But I chose uh, as a young lad to stay with my grandparents and, and, and to be with them. And it was not uncommon uh, any given morning in the summertime to have three or four of us grandkids together around the breakfast table. It was just something that was secure, something that we saw the love of our grandparents and enjoyed uh, being with them in their presence. But one of the things that I remember every morning uh, in the spring and also in the summertime, uh, sitting at the breakfast table, uh, eating breakfast, there was a cherry tree uh, that sat in the backyard of my grandparents' house or at their house 
next to the deck and its and its limbs hanged over the deck and cherries would often fall off of the of the tree onto the deck and birds would be everywhere in fact when we finished eating breakfast for fun we would go outside and take some of those cherries because the tree would be full not only of cherries but also of every kind of bird that you could possibly uh, think of especially uh, blackbirds they were there and they were eating and feasting on them cherries but some of the birds would would sit or perch on other things waiting for their turn to come and grab for themselves a cherry. So the fun thing about going out onto the deck is picking cherries off of that tree and tossing them. And when you would toss them cherries up in the air, those birds that were perching uh, on, on different trees or different things would swoop in uh, and grab those cherries and take off with them. You could almost watch a fight take place in the air where three birds were coming together at one time to attack this flying cherry that's, that's going through the air. Well, that was what country kids done as a way of fun. But every morning when we would go to breakfast and every morning when we would see the birds perching in the tree and every morning when we would look at this tree, there's something that remained the same from day to day. Is that it was a cherry tree. It produced a wealth of cherries. Never did it change to something else. In other words, every time you seen this tree, the fruit thereof indicated cherry tree. You might be asking yourself, how does that tie in to what we're talking about here? The fruit of true forgiveness. This is what I want us to understand this morning. As we look into these passages, these two verses that's nestled tightly in between the Lord's Prayer and fasting. What are we going to do with forgiveness? And how that Jesus has recorded this, or Matthew has recorded Jesus saying this to his disciples. And you have to have a greater picture of the context in what Jesus is saying as you read through the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, if you go just to these two verses, they're not going to make sense outside of the bigger context of what Jesus is saying. And if you look at the Sermon on the Mount as he's preaching and teaching, not only to his disciples, but to the crowds. He's teaching that there's a greater heart work that takes place in an individual. There's a greater heart work that has been ushered in to our world through the messianic kingdom, which is Christ. All these things come to us by way of heart change. Of old, it was said to do this, but Jesus says we're doing this. It's looking within one soul. It's looking inside of our hearts and realizing what we have become through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we look at these passages. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. What I want you to see looking at these two passages this morning is this. The fruit of true forgiveness flows out of a changed heart. The fruit of true forgiveness always flows out of a changed heart. In other words, if you're not careful when you're, you're reading these passages of Scripture, you could very easily condition your salvation off of you being able to forgive other people. If you look at verse 14, for if you forgive others... For their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you're not careful, it can be taken out of context in such a way that you say, well, we must do this in order to receive this. We must be able to extend 
forgiveness in this area or we're not going to receive the grace and the mercy and the salvation of our God. And that would be very dangerous. But if you're looking at a greater context, a bigger context, and fitting that into the context, you realize that no, that's not what Jesus is teaching at all. Should believers forgive? Absolutely. Should believers extend that same forgiveness and that same grace that has been shown to them to other people? Most certainly. But that is the characteristic trait of what it means to have a changed heart and what it means to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, God's not saying do this and you'll receive this. That is what we call behavioral modification. And there's many people that go through uh, a sense of behavior modification where they're trying to change their own lives. They're trying to, to extend forgiveness. And while doing so, they are not only hurt but frustrated because they don't understand that salvation doesn't rest in us being able to change ourselves. Salvation rests in the very gospel changing who we are and changing our hearts so that it flows, our forgiveness flows out of a changed heart for the glory of God. So we do not want to take any passage out of context. Is it important for believers to forgive one another? Absolutely. But let's read as to what Jesus is telling his disciples, which is coming off of the Lord's Prayer. In fact, verse 12, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. You look at verse 14 and it makes sense. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive forgive you but verse 15 there's a condition there's a there's a conjunction there but if you do not forgive others then your father will not forgive you it makes sense when you take it in its original context to understand that true the tr the fruit of true forgiveness always flows out of a changed heart for God's glory. It is because of what the gospel has brought to us. It is because of the ushering in of the kingdom of God. It is because of what Jesus has accomplished for us that we cannot possibly accomplish for ourselves. Conversion is a miracle. What Christ has accomplished by being our propitiation, by satisfying the wrath of God, and by extending grace to you and I uh, is a miracle. And we need to understand it in its context to know that God is not conditioning our salvation or who we are off of what we have to do. No, it is, it is the fruit that flows from a changed heart. In other words, you could look at it like this. We are saved if we've trusted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we've believed in Him and in Him alone. If we've, if we've come to Him recognizing and realizing that we cannot be who we need to be for Him and for His glory apart from Him. But after having realized that, experiencing the grace of God, having our hearts changed, raised from deadness, Having a heart of divine stimuli put into our chest that not only beats for the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also beats for carrying out his word for his glory. Then you can view it like this. Forgiveness is, is not a condition to receive God's salvation, but forgiveness is evidence that we have received God's salvation. Our Extending forgiveness to other people is not because we're good enough to extend that forgiveness. Our being able to love other people when they are not lovable is not in ourselves something that we can do alone. 
being able to extend forgiveness and love and grace to other people is only a characteristic trait of someone that has experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the true fruit of, of, of these passages is, is a, a flowing out of something that's already been recreated. Something that's already been changed, which is the human heart. Now, that does not mean that we do not struggle with forgiveness. We don't want to go too far and create any kind of discouragement for people that, yes, are loving the gospel. They're loving Jesus Christ. They've experienced a, a, a saving relationship with Jesus. But yet, on the other hand, they are still struggling so much with who they are now, what remains. And, and through their sanctification period to be able to forgive other people. We don't want to go too far and cause doubt. But we want to treat scripture as God would have us to treat scripture. We want to paint for you a true picture of what it really means to be converted. What these two verses nestle tightly in between the Lord's prayer and fasting, what they really mean and how we are to extend that forgiveness to other people. We extend that forgiveness because we've been forgiven. We extend that forgiveness because our hearts have been resurrected. Our hearts have been changed. Think about it just for a moment. Someone that's not willing to entertain forgiving somebody else. Well, you can just dissect that scripturally speaking. Someone that's not willing to extend that forgiveness to someone else is someone that does not understand for themselves the forgiveness that they received and they did not deserve it. It's one thing for us to say, I'm not going to forgive this person or that person or this group of people. But it's altogether different when we look into Scripture and we think for a moment that because of our attitude and because of the wickedness of our heart, that perhaps we haven't fully developed or understood the gospel of Jesus Christ in a saving manner. And maybe that's why we're not willing to extend that same forgiveness and that same grace which we know, uh, looking at Scripture, that we do not deserve. We do not deserve God's grace. We do not deserve the propitiation for our sins. We do not deserve the righteousness of Christ. And yet that's why we call it grace because it is unmerited favor that God would send His only Son to die in our place and to extend us something that we do not deserve. And we didn't work for it. And we didn't accomplish it. God did. So now you can kind of understand that the fruit of true forgiveness always flows out of a changed heart. I enjoy watching uh, different TV shows that pertain to investigations. Uh, people investigation, investigate excuse me, different crimes and things that have, have happened in people's lives. And, and some of the testimonies that you hear uh, from those people at the end of those shows is jaw-dropping. Some of which are professing faith in the gospel. Some that would say, hey, the Lord has changed my heart and my faith and trust is in Him. But yet to hear them speak and the fruit that they are exhibiting doesn't speak. To a changed heart. I've heard people say I cannot forgive that person. In fact, I've heard people say I will not forgive that person. Now we're not minimizing what these people have gone through. And we're not wanting to minimize the emotional roller coaster that these people that, that some of these people are on because of what has been committed against them and, and to them. We do not want to do that, but we want to pull out the hard issues that's going on. 
It is strong language to say, I will not and I cannot forgive somebody and yet say that I have a converted heart. That I, I am changed by the blood of Christ. We can struggle to forgive somebody. We can wrestle with it on a daily basis to forgive somebody. But as believers in the gospel, if our hearts have been changed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God, then we can choose to forgive people. I can understand someone with a black heart or somebody that's not experienced conversion. Somebody that's lost and they do not claim to have had an encounter with God. I can understand those people saying, I, I, I can't forgive them and I don't want to forgive them and I'm not going to forgive them. I can understand that because they are in bondage to who they are. Scripture teaches that before conversion, we are in bondage to self. That before conversion, we are in bondage to our own depravity. That prior to conversion, that our wills are bent toward sin. That's who we are. That's what we do. But once Christ changes the heart, the power of the Spirit of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached to someone. And, and when someone exercises saving faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God is resurrecting and changing and has changed that person's heart and will continue to change progressively so throughout their walk. Then it's a different ballgame. Our will then should be in bondage to what we love, which is no longer sin and depravity and blackness, but it should be in bondage to the glory of God and to Christ and to His kingdom and to His work and carrying that out for His glory. This is why Jesus can say to His disciples, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. He's speaking to a group of people, his disciples, into their heart. And Jesus knows, greater than we know, that out of a changed heart flows an attitude of forgiveness. That out of a changed heart, one might struggle to forgive, but one can choose to forgive because they've experienced the saving grace of God. So it's dangerous when we mess around and we say, you know, I can't forgive somebody. You look at verse 15, but if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. That should remind us this morning of how important it is to mirror the grace that has changed our hearts to other people, to extend that same grace that we've been given, to extend it also to other people. Now, there's a few applicational points here when it comes to forgiving a brother or a sister. Notice I did not say that it will always be easy because that's not so. We struggle. So much so from day to day, week to week, month to month, with our own sinfulness, with our own hearts. But there's some applicational points here in what forgiveness really means. When one has experienced the gospel, the Spirit of God has applied that gospel to their hearts. Their hearts have been changed. Then they can choose in light of the gospel and the power of the Spirit to extend that forgiveness and that grace to other people because they have been extended grace and mercy and love when they did not deserve it. So when we're extending forgiveness to people and we're working through that in a gospel manner, that doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle. That doesn't mean that Satan's not going to bring that to our remembrance a lot of times. 
That doesn't mean that when you see that person that sometimes those feelings begin to resurface. But what it does mean is that because you are walking in the gospel and because you understand grace, which is unmerited favor, that it's something you did not do to gain, but it was something that was extended to you freely because of the work of another. Then you can choose to say, I will forgive whomever. And when you do that, you're essentially agreeing to, I'm not going to bring it up to them again. I'm not going to sit around and stew over it. And I most certainly am not going to gossip and talk to other people about our issue. That's practical. And that's what God is calling His people to do. Is to mirror that grace. To be what you really are if you really are in the gospel. To allow the fruit of the gospel to flow outside of the pores of your skin, out of the thoughts and the intents of your heart, to recognize and to realize that no one on this side of eternity deserves grace. But because our God is good, and because our God is loving, and because He is a saving God, that He has extended grace to us. And in that extending grace, that conversion that takes place when a person trusts in the gospel of Jesus Christ, when the Spirit of God is working in their hearts to raise dead stony hearts, to bring them to life that they can respond, we recognize and we realize how unworthy we are to be saved from whom we are. We deserve hell. That's our rightful place. And God would be just to send us all to that place. He would still be God and he would still be just. But yet he extended grace to us. By saving us. Giving us the righteousness of his son. Applying that to our lives. That we can in turn extend that same love and that same grace to people that we think we could never forgive. It's dangerous to ride the fence. It's dangerous to err out on, I don't have to forgive somebody. You just don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand what they've done and how bad they've done it to me and my family. Do you understand what you've done and how bad you've done it to Jesus Christ. And yet he still underwent the wrath of his father. Died on the cross. Was buried and yet raised again in newness of life. That he could extend his righteousness to you. That you could experience justification. Declared to be right in the eyes of the father. Through the work of Jesus Christ. You can forgive because you've been forgiven. And as believers, looking, in these, looking to these passages, for if you forgive others for their transgression, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Understanding them in context, that we're not doing anything to merit the grace of our God. It's not conditioned. Our salvation is not conditioned on anything that we do, but on Jesus alone. Then we walk away realizing that the fruit of true forgiveness always flows out of an already changed heart for God's glory. I never had to wonder when I walked out on the back porch at my grandmother's if that cherry tree was going to have cherries on it 
or perhaps it might be bananas one day or oranges. I didn't have to wonder that because it was a cherry tree. By nature, it was a cherry tree. And by its nature, it produced only cherries. Well, the question I really want to leave with you is the root of who you are bedded in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is the root of who you are bedded in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because if your roots are embedded in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the fruit of your life would be one of forgiveness because you too have experienced the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of our God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning thanking you for your love for us. Father, helping us to understand that our forgiveness, it, our salvation is not conditioned on us being able to do something to extend forgiveness, but that our forgiving people is evidence that we have experienced the grace of God, that we've tasted the heavenly gift, that salvation has been applied to our heart and to our lives. And Father, perhaps there's people listening this morning that struggle to extend forgiveness. I'm not saying that we don't struggle. Believers struggle with sin. We are not 